I was thinking and thinking how the sounds of the winds of the butterflies are. I called a friend in Greece who is an audio designer and he said, JC, you blow my mind with this question. So, but this is what I created for you. So speaking about butterflies, today in our episode we will talk about monarch butterflies and how is the process that they do the fantastic job, what is the relationship between monarch butterflies and milkweed and our guest is Ted Kuklinski, the president of Newton Conservators. This is Circular Podcast, the podcast that helps to create awareness about the effects of climate change, the real importance of sustainability, recycling, and circular economy. This is Circular Podcast, and I am Juan Carlos Giraldo. Okay, I am here in Cold Spring Park in Newton Center with Tech Kuklinski. As I mentioned in the intro, we're going to talk about a little bit the monarch butterflies, which he's uh, very into this kind of topic. How are you, Ted? How are you? Oh, very good. Uh, it's great to uh, to meet you and, and be here on this beautiful fall day in uh, Cold Spring Park, one of the larger parks in uh, in Newton. It's really you might even call it the central part of Newton. <laughs> no, it's a very nice, you know, it's easy easy to walk here with the, with, with the family, with the dogs, etc. Ted, always I ask my guests if they can share a little bit about themselves. Could you share with us what is your background? Tell me about, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I've, I've always had a, a, a sort of an amateur interest in nature. I'm actually a computer scientist, um, uh, currently retired. Um, but I've taken over uh, currently as the president of Newton Conservators, which is the open space land trust organization in Newton. So, you know, our goal is to uh, preserve open space, and uh, we do a lot of things to educate people about the open space in Newton and elsewhere. But, uh, you know, we, we have bird walks and talks on geology mm-hmm. and uh we do a lot of invasive plant removal, things like that. So anything open space, nature related, we're we're kind of involved in, and we try to get people and other people involved. And you know, pretty much all our events are free and yeah. open to the public. And so that's great. So that's 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 kind of my new my second career here. Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Ted, uh, let's talk about um, monarch butterflies. When did your passion? for these wonderful pollinators that started? How so? Well, it, I think it started when we, in our front yard, we, we planted some wildflowers about, I don't know, 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, you know, they came up and uh, at one point we noticed a, a, a different kind of plant that showed up in the corner of our front yard and it, it turned out to be milkweed yeah. Uh, you know, it's called common milkweed. It, uh, so it it was we just had one two plants there, but over the years it kind of spread a little bit, in, in, and uh, we encouraged it. So uh, you know, looking up information, we found that uh, yeah, this is the uh, milkweed family is the only plant that um, monarch butterflies rely on. There's mm-hmm. pretty orange and black butterflies. Uh, we hadn't seen many around in in um, in recent years, uh, but when when the milkweed started to populate, then we 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 would occasionally see see them. Uh, we might don't you know there were some seasons we'd only see one or two the whole summer, which right. was disappointing. So so we we we, tr- we just let the milkweed grow uh, grow. My my wife. Uh, uh, she didn't want. She she's a gardener, and uh, she likes uh, some 
orders, but you know, yep. it's important to have both flowers and exactly. milkweed. So, so we tur- we basically um, turned it into a, a milkweed garden. And uh, the past uh, couple summers, we, you know, it's been quite successful. Um, we, a friend of mine, came came by and and uh, actually showed me where to look for the mo- for monarch eggs. <laughs> we, I had been looking for years to yeah. to see if I could find. Little, you know, the little tiny eggs that the monarchs leave, and I mm-hmm. kept looking and looking, and I, I could never find them right. until Eric Olson, who's um, he's, he teaches biology at uh, Brandeis. Right. Um, he drove by and he said, "Oh, you you got to look in the little tiny plants, uh, <laughs> the the young plants, because that's they're nice and tender when that when the eggs hatch, they will." So, following his advice, I, I became actually myself and my wife became very. Uh, cognizant of where to look, and and in the past two years we've we've really gotten a passion for for doing this. Yeah. We've we've found the eggs. The problem was that we had a, we had a lot of milkweed, but and we we did find eggs. But when we'd find them, I I kind of would put little sticky notes on the eggs or on the on this the leaves bad. where the eggs were, yeah. and I'd come back later and the eggs were gone. Oh, and. So it turns out that the eggs are very vulnerable to predators yeah. of, uh, you know, spiders, ants, you know, a, a little little other types of bugs will just hunt around on the leaves and, and then eat the eggs or, yep. or take them. So about uh, last year, we, we started actually bringing the eggs inside. We would um, pick the leaves and then take them inside and put them in a little container, mm-hmm. like a, a yeah, little really takeout did. container, um, you know, something right. that you would, uh, you know, a little plastic and a good good recycling. Yep. So you just basically, we would get the container. Like a, like a nursery in there. A, we have a little caterpillar nursery or an <laughs> egg nursery. So, so you get a, a little plastic container that you can seal up and you... You put a, a moist paper towel in the bottom, and you put the leaf in there, and you maybe, maybe put some other milkweed leaves in there because that's the only thing when they hatch they're going to eat. So you put with the with the egg in there. After within a week, the egg will hatch, and there'll be this tiniest little caterpillar. They're very small, little, right. and you know we've been fortunate enough to actually see see them hatch sometime mm-hmm. uh, because the the egg. The egg is so is very small. It's sort of a football-shaped yep. little tiny egg, but you you would think it was just a little nothing, really. <laughs> so it was there, but it, it it's incredible that inside that egg it uh, grows this little tiny caterpillar, which just comes out, eats the shell of the egg, and then starts to chew away on this on leaf. the leaf. Yeah, and it makes a little basically a hole in the in the leaf, and it just it just grows uh, almost exponentially because it, it's so. Uh, that's a, its job is just to eat. Speaking about your passion about the monarchs, um, this situation start when you visit Maine, right? When you visit, if the memory is okay, we meet the Charlotte Rose Butterfly Garden in Southwest Harbor. Tell me about this nice experience. Is it was like um, inspiring for you? Yeah, yeah. I think it really opened our eyes to uh, to what could be done. Mm-hmm. It's it's a ver- it's a it's a small but beautiful garden in Southwest Harbor, Maine. Uh, it's it's tagged as a butterfly garden. We passed by it many times, you know, on our travels to Acadia National Park and whatever. And uh, but once we stopped in, um, mm-hmm. you know, two or three years ago, and one of the gardeners there was kind enough to show us uh, oh well we raise monarch butterflies here and I said well how do you do that <laughs> and uh, so she she took us around and she they have loads of pollinator plants beautiful garden I highly recommend but they had a little shed where they uh, when they found eggs or caterpillars crawling on their on their uh, on their milkweed mm-hmm. they would just cut the stems and then um, take them inside, put them in water in a, a little enclosed uh, mesh cage or mesh, you know, cloth mm-hmm. mesh. Uh, and that would protect them from, uh, from, the, um, from the, the predators and so on. Right. You know, because birds will go for the caterpillars and, 
when they're small anyway. And uh, so that, uh, that brought us to the second stage. That should really showed us what we could, we could be doing because they had these, they had um, milkweeds that they had cut off and, and they were just crawling with the, with the wow. mature caterpillars and they had butterflies that were just hatching and they had chrysalises in the cage. You know, so so we, had, we, we went home right away. We, we immediately ordered one of these things online. <laughs> and, uh, to start the work. And uh, so we had our, uh, our little nursery, which we found very effective, uh, the little containers. But when the, when the caterpillars hatch and they, they, get to, they can survive in the, in, the, in the nursery for, you know, uh, a week or two. Right. And they, they grow. And when they're about an inch long, we kind of transfer them over into the, uh, we, we basically cut off some milkweed that we have in the garden, which we have. We, at this point, we probably have over 200 milkweed plants or right. something. And then we, we, we put them on the, uh, we just cut off the milkweed, put it in water, put it in our little mesh protective cage. And then they, uh, they, from there, they just get fat and uh, they, they get to be about two inches long and, wow. and very chubby little caterpillars and very hungry caterpillar, literally. <laughs> And uh, th so they they do very well in there, and it, you know when if if they they can eat up a stalk pretty well, and you know we just get some more stalks or leaves and just put them in the in the. That's awesome. And then they eventually, at, at one point, they will uh, get big enough that they decide, well, it's time to go become a chrysalis. You know, I think uh, uh, time for a rest. So they they feed voraciously the last day most of the times they they will climb up onto the top of the mesh cage or sometimes a little or the bottom of a leaf and then they they will attach themselves to the to the roof mm -hmm. with uh, some kind of super glue that they they seem they to yep. they have and uh they will hang there uh as a caterpillar and then uh in the usually in the they, you can tell this is happening because they turn it they they make a j shape Yeah, uh, I read it. The little, you know, they actually form the letter J. Um, so when that happens, you know that pretty soon um, they're going to, to turn into a chrysalis. Mm -hmm. So usually it's in the morning. So they'll, they'll, hang, they'll climb up, you know, on a given day, hang there overnight. And then in the morning, you have to be really observant if you want to catch the, uh, the process oh, the because process. it doesn't take that long. Yeah. But it's quite amazing. It's almost like something from a science fiction movie. Wow. So... The caterpillar is in the J. It straightens out, and then from the head, sort of the antenna, or you know, they're they're moving around, and but they become sort of limp. And then from the head, it the the skin of the caterpillar splits open, and then it does this wriggling dance that <laughs> just kind of shake, shaky, shaky, shaky. You know, it it just wiggles, and um, uh, I I think. I would use Taylor Swift's "Shake It Off" as as the theme music for that, but but it, it kind of um, keeps splitting open and wriggling off the the outer skin, which is really the you know if you think of a caterpillar, it's sort of like a barcode, mm -hmm. you know, because it's yeah, got the black exactly. stripes. Well, this the skin is transparent with black stripes, and it it kind of just moves up to the top where the, where it's attached, and it just compresses it up, and then. It, It shakes around. The, there's a, inside is this green, yellow larvae kind of thing. It's sort of a worm, mm -hmm. fat worm kind of thing. It it shakes enough, keeps shaking until it gets rid of that. It, it actually the skin falls off onto the onto the floor, mm -hmm. and then it wriggles around some more. It does them a little more dance. It, it has sort of the same the same segmented se sections in it as the caterpillar, but over the next. Um, hour or whatever it will turn into this smooth bean like structure mm -hmm. right. which which uh, becomes very smooth and actually is quite gorgeous it's a it's a brilliant emerald green or a very light yep. green with gold dots along the, along the edges and it really is quite good camouflage for the uh, for against the predators yeah they they probably wouldn't notice it and In fact, uh, you know, I don't think we, we we've never found one of these in our garden, you know, from look from looking because it it's so well camouflaged. But well, this sounds very interesting because you know what? I have a question for you. 
what is the why the why the relationship the, between the monarch butterflies and the milkweed? Why they only lay the eggs there? And the second one question is like um, speaking about milkweed. It's very sad and concerning that the milkweed are under threat because of the pesticides. Yes. What can we do about it? No, it's a very good question because um, they they. They do rely on on milkweed. If there's no milkweed, the butterflies can't exist because they have no place to lay their eggs, and they they um, they have nothing to eat. So, and the milkweed and the and the monarch butterfly have a kind of a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. um, by eating the milkweed, milkweed has. It's called milkweed because it has a, a milky sap yeah. in, inside the leaves and, and so on. So if you ever break open a milkweed, you'll, you know it, it looks like milk. Mm -hmm. But by it, but it, it is somewhat poisonous to other um, creatures in you know in large quantities. So so if a bird, well, it, right. when when a when a bird tastes a monarch butterfly the first time, it, it it does not. It's not a pleasant experience. So they they well, yeah, no, they that, realize no I don't things. I want to leave those monarch butterflies al al alone, alone because they eat the milkweed and that and if you see how much they eat they just are constantly the caterpillars are just eating all the time they're mm -hmm. just going did 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 you know they're like like you eat a corn on the cob like. they're eating milkweed leaf <laughs> it, it's just it's that's the closest analog that I can see wow. um, but. The, so the, I think that's the reason why um, there have not been so many monarchs in recent years. They, the, the numbers have drastically declined mm -hmm. because of pesticides. Uh, and the, the, you know, milkweed is sort of has a name that is unfortunate because it has the name weed in it. <laughs> so, yeah. so people say, oh, I don't want milkweed. Be, you know, it's a weed. Get rid of it. You know, right. so so you know you see a lot of garden. You won't see it in a lot of gardens, mm -hmm. but it, in fact, it's a it's a very beautiful flower. Yeah. Um, and since it's the only thing that monarch, monarchs really rely on it, so so we I mean we we felt that our garden was was a little uh, way station. So we actually registered as a, as a way station. We saw that Charlotte Rhodes Garden was. Registered as with an org <laughs> with an organization called Monarch Watch, so we joined that, and we 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 have a little sign in our yard that says, you know, we're a registered way station with with Monarch Watch. So, and we've done that for our our local park, Wellington Park here in Newton. Uh, we have put in a butterfly garden with uh, three different kinds of milkweed and lots of other pollinator type oh. flowers and so on. So, That's good. so we're. We're trying to spread the word a little bit about, uh, okay, let the milkweed grow. Uh, a, a lot of it, you know, particularly in the Midwest, probably the uh, due to pesticides for, mm -hmm. you know, so they don't get other pests. But that unfortunately does does the caterpillars in. So and they don't want the you know, milkweed stands have just been eliminated. I mean, we we see some here in Newton. I, I I've seen milkweed in people's yard one time and then you know a couple of weeks later it, they, 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 they've got yeah, it they it's either. going to lawn we don't need enough we have plenty of lawn right. lawn is is not as such a diverse biodiverse area as what you can have mm -hmm. um, by by having some milkweed in your yard so um, so and then what kind of advice you will say to the our neighbors what kind of suggestions about uh, to preserve this very interesting pollinator? Because the monarch butterflies are so important, like the bees as well. What kind of suggestions you would say? Well, I would say plant more milkweed. It's you know it can grow very easily once it's once it's established, um, and it provides you know the flowers are terrific for not just the monarchs, they're they're for all the other butterflies and bees. I, I know in our, in our yard, I can probably count 12 different kinds of bees easily. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen so many different little creatures that have gone, that, that's, that are dependent on the milkweed plant. So uh, it's not hard to, you know, you can, the seeds, um, you can, milkweed makes pods uh, in the fall. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you, um, 
you can get a hold of some of the seeds, or you can you can you can buy seeds. You know, our, our organization will sell them you know, mm-hmm. or, or give them away, really. And so, if you you can plant them in the fall, or you can wait till spring or and grow them in little uh, pots or whatever, yeah. or you know, you can just get some seeds and just kind of just scratch rub. the scratch the earth, put them down, let them overwinter. They the thing about the milkweed seeds is that they need sort of cold hardening. Oh, or, or they need to have some frost or freezing temperatures oh, to uh, you'll get more. If you just take them and keep them in a, in, in a room or something and then plant them, they're not going to do. Oh, I see. You'll get much very like very, a chili t- the chili time. They they need the chili time just as as in nature. So so you know the fall is actually a good time to plant. Oh, I see. Uh, There's three different kinds that are common around uh, uh, New England. So it's common milkweed, mm-hmm. uh, what's called butterfly weed. That's, that's a, it's, some, it's sort of orange and lower to the ground, colorful. And swamp milkweed, which is pretty tall and has pretty pink flowers, like the common milk. Common mm-hmm. milkweed is very pretty. And I always, the common milkweed, I always say, looks sort of like fireworks. You wow. know, when a fireworks bursts, it's just these beautiful little pink blossoms and very fragrant. I mean, you know, if you go buy a stand of milkweed in the summer, in July or whatever, it's just so fragrant. And That's good. So we have to encourage our neighbors who like, have to plant more uh, milkweed. Let's talk about Newton Conservators. What is the goal, the main goal of you, the organization that you are the head there? Uh, well, I, I'd say our main goal, we're a land trust, and uh, yeah, our main goal is the acquisition of open space for, uh, for Newton. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've, we're, we've been very active over the years uh, in trying to acquire new open space. So, for instance, there, in Newton here, there's a, a Newton Community Farm. Well, we were very instrumental in uh, in in acquiring that for the city. One of the big instruments we have is the Community Preservation Act, uh, commonly known as CPA. Uh, so that was a, a, a wonderful thing in the early 2000s that takes 1% of our property tax and uh, augmented by some of the other mo- money from the state mm-hmm. into a fund which could be you know, some millions of dollars a year originally. Um, And that could be used for acquisition of open space, for affordable housing, for historic preservation, and for uh, recreation uses. So that was a great tool for the city to be able to acquire open space. And, uh, I mean, right now we're working um, to acquire, or the city, um, you know, just recently announced its intention to, um, to, to uh, acquire uh, an area called, known as Webster Woods. Oh, the Webster Woods, and it, um, it, it was on College, right? It's, OBU? It's, OBU? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, it's not that far from here. Oh, yeah. but, Beautiful. But along the Hammond Pond the Reser- Hammond Pond, yeah. area, it's, it, it, it abuts some of the city land and some of the land owned by DCR, mm-hmm. uh, which is state land, uh, and uh, by the old uh, Michigan Tefila Temple. Yep. area that BC um, mm-hmm. so so that's 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 the kind of thing uh, we, we want to preserve it for for, uh, for for our for for our grandchildren uh, you know for future generations because you know we, they're not building any more open space in Newton really well, uh, we, we're, we're a very developed city and uh, you know parcels like this very important particularly that's a, an important parcel because it contains uh, a vernal pool bear pond which is the home for yellow spotted salamanders and, and other creatures that can only exist there and and that's part of the land that we're trying to acquire that's and, that's a, it's a good point because it's the only way to have a more green space as well and change and preserve all the environment that we have here and in this beautiful town. Especially important for climate change, yes. Exactly. Yes. Now, we are almost uh, finishing this conversation, Ted. Where people can reach uh, more information about Newton Conservators? Uh, well, we have a, a wonderful website, newtonconservators.org. Okay, <laughs> no, don't worry. This link will be in, in the okay. episode. Okay. Um, Ted, I don't know if you have uh, final words, if you want to share with, uh, with the audience. Uh, take a look at our website. Um, we have a we we have a very good 
schedule right on our main page of all the free events uh, that are open space related in Newton in Newton and, and, and neighboring towns. So uh, that's a great way to get out and see uh, some of the wonderful things in nature that we have around here. Uh, I did want to finish the story on the monarch butterfly. Okay, tell me. So the, uh, w w I think we got to the point where we have this, this gr the chrysalis, and so the, the, um, that will s basically just sit there for about a week week and a half, two weeks, and it will just look like a green bean. When it gets near the end, you can see things starting to happen. The color changes a little bit. It becomes a little more transparent. You can actually see sort of some wings inside, uh, you know, the, the making, you know, how monarch wings are, you know, black and orange. You, know, you can start to see that a little bit. So it, the, the chrysalis turns a little darker, and when that happens, then you know it's it's pretty soon that there's a butterfly that's going to emerge. So usually it happens in the morning, uh, and sometimes you have to get up pretty early to catch it. Uh, <laughs> but it's 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 quite a fascinating thing if you can actually see it happen. But it, very similar to um, you know like the uh, the J, the J caterpillar turning into mm -hmm. a chrysalis, then inside the chrysalis is the butterfly. So all of a sudden it will split from the bottom and from this little t little bean come will it will cr this insect will crawl out and it's a very fat it has a very fat body uh, and the reason is because that body is full of fluid uh, uh, and it has very small wings they're sort of shriveled up looking but it will crawl out and it will cling onto the um, the reedless, which is transparent and over the next hour it will kind of pump the fluid out of its um, abdomen mm -hmm. and into the wings and the wings will kind of expand out and become the beautiful one. become big wings and and then it will just sit there and will just open its wings and it has to dry off it has to get rid of all that fluid oh. it will just hang there when it finally is dried off enough it'll it'll take some very tentative steps away from the uh, from the chrysalis and say, wow, look at me. I, I'm a butterfly. I can't <laughs> believe this. I went in like a caterpillar and, and I come out like a, wow, well, I've got wings. I've got big antennas and, you know, I, wow, this is amazing. So, so it'll, it will just flap a, a little bit. It's not going to fly it. it. Eventually it, it may take a, its first little flight in, in, in the cage. It's good. Mm -hmm. So with that, we, um, w we can do is, um, you could just stick your hand in the, in the cage. It'll readily crawl onto it. You can just take it and take it out of the cage and put it on a flower oh, or sometimes it will just, it'll, it'll stay on you. Maybe it'll crawl on your, on your, on your shirt or something. And but then it will it will maybe take take a flight up into a tree where it'll stay on a flower and just feed for a little. Uh, well, it doesn't feed the first day, but the, but it just you know looks around and oh okay. And one one thing we we've we've done the the end the last generation is the one that that will fly to Mexico. Um, the ones before they they will mate and lay eggs and so on. But when, beginning in like mid August through. Um, you know, September, mm -hmm. uh, this last generation of butterflies, uh, they sense the, the, the temperature changing, they sense the change in daylight, and they will, they don't actually mate. What they, so they save up their energy, and they will be the ones that fly all the way to central Mexico. They'll spend the winter there, coming back. then they will uh, mate in the spring, they'll fly a little bit north, maybe into Texas or so on. Uh, and then they will they will die because the usual the, the regular butterflies only last like three weeks wow. so it's a short lifetime for it for that's sad that's it, sad because they are so important for our planet yeah but but these last ones have are super butterflies and they they, they have the power to, to maybe make it all the way they don't all make it but but that migration has been tracked and uh you know that's uh it's quite quite a, a, a miracle of migration, c considering how how little they weigh and all the you know they have to run into hurricanes or, or 
and you all, know, all the process catch them and, and all the process they have to came through yeah it, it, it's really <clears throat> quite a miracle and yep. uh, one of the things that we started to do this year was actually tag butterflies which is this is how they know that butterflies from here can make it to mexico so there's a the monarch watch they will they will give you um you can send away and get some little tiny stickers little round stickers with serial numbers on them so we've taken the, the butterflies that we've raised and we've probably raised about two dozen this year and we gently take the sticker on a little toothpick and just kind of place it on the wing in a certain spot that's been known to not harm them and not hurt their flight so much and you know just gently press it on there and then then we release them and then if that sticker is ever if if that butterfly is ever found you know dead along the way or or actually in mexico uh we'll get a notice about that so oh. So that's what we're 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 very excited about because um, this is the first year we've done the tagging thing. That's good because the tagging will help you like a, like at your own data, how is the process. Yeah, right? but this is done by thousands of people around the country. Oh. Uh, uh, they, and and they in Mexico they actually hi, hire locals. It helps the local economy to actually look for the butterflies with the tags, and wow. then record the fact that they got there. So. Unbelievable! Uh, so that's that's uh, and, impressive. And we've we've recruited a number of other people. We've had some uh, some when we went away on vacation, we 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 turn our our butterflies and chrysalises over to some friends, uh, actually elementary school kids, <laughs> <laughs> and they had such a great time doing this uh, this process as well. So, uh, and the other people that have seen this. The, the whole process of raising a butterfly it is very easy to do. You know, they uh, had quite a few other people that have started raising butterflies as well. That's good. So I think if you know to to help grow the population by protecting them, by growing the milkweed, by protecting the eggs, by growing the butterflies, we get a lot more butterflies, uh, and and I think I think the population will survive. That's great. And work. also, it's, it's we're like all a, doing a little bit. Yeah, no, it's, and, and it's you, helping the pollination with the plants and everything. So it, it's that's, great for the environment. That's awesome. It's great for the environment, and is if we do if we do that, we become like advocates as well to to protect uh, our planet. Nasim Tete, thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been a great pleasure meeting you, and talking about the uh, environment. So perfect. Thank you for your time, Ted. I am JC Giraldo from Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you, everyone. This is Circular Podcast, the podcast that helps to create awareness about the effects of climate change, the real importance of sustainability, recycling, and circular economy. This is Circular Podcast, and I am Juan Carlos Giraldo. Circular Podcast.